you guys again. I love you. And I've missed you. Um, I was very excited when Kelsey told me the theme of this because I have been in a prolonged season of hard things long, 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 long. And I knew that it rolls. <laughs> I knew that seeking after the Lord for his heart and his words would bring refreshment to me. Um, and so I came to the Lord and said, I'm tired. I'm weary. I need refreshment. I'm thirsty. I'm sick. Uh, I'm, I'm discouraged. I've been depressed. I need hope. And I need life. And don't we go through seasons like that from time to time? And as the Lord is, he always, always meets us. Over there on the wall, it says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my burden, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So I need this conference. And I think you do too because you're humans. And as Carissa said, Jesus is the source. I love this card, by the way. Jesus is the source. He is the springs, plural. He is the source of life and rest and refreshment in all of those things. So I just uh, started opening my Bible, and, and I looked up the word uh, refresh. I looked up the word springs, fountains, and I just... I started, uh, this isn't typically the way I teach, but I started making a list of all those verses and reading them and chewing on them and, and dwelling and just, just living in them. The first one, um, I'm going to be, this is not going to be a, I'm not going to go through one passage. So if you take notes, you, you might want to write these down because you could read them later and, and they will they will encourage you. But... The first, the first verse that I came upon was Isaiah 12, 3. And it said, Therefore you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. And I was thinking about that word, joyously. Because I hadn't felt joyful in quite some time. It is that way when we go through prolonged hard things sometimes. Um... You know, we know the verse, okay, um, the joy, uh, uh, oh, I can't even remember it. About the joy of our salvation is our strength. But you have to, rem you know, for me, I had to go back and, and think about that, that you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. Some, you know, when I'm weak and tired and weary, I'll go to the Lord, I'll open his word, but I'm not really thinking, I, there, there isn't really joy involved sometimes. Sometimes, because I'm human. But what I did was I stopped and I went back and I thought about when I got saved, when he saved me. And the freedom that came with that. Do you remember? Do you remember when the beauty of the gospel penetrated your heart and, and it melted you and you felt his love. Um, so I started thinking about that and I thought, you know, and Josh talked about that, um, whatever day this is, this is Saturday, Thursday night. 
out of Peter um, that you know, it listed these attributes that we should be growing in. And it said, um, I got to look it up. He just talked about if, if you're not growing in those things, then we have forgotten. Help me out. Who knows that verse? We have forgotten. Uh, be more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you'll never stumble. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, the, the one up before that. He who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from former sins. Having forgotten his purification for his former sins. So as I started into this, I just was reminding myself of what he saved me from. Because it was ugly. It was ugly. Psalm 13 is just six little verses long. But it's one of those psalms that starts with, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? And then he says, consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten mine eyes, which means change my perspective. Help me to see this differently. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have overcome him. Lest my adversaries rejoice when I'm shaken. Now that was how he felt. All of those, all that, you know, um, how long, O oh Lord, that despair and discouragement, those are feelings. That's how he felt. And then he asks the Lord to change his perspective. And now you see how he behaves, despite how he felt, what his actions are. He then asks God to change his perspective, and he starts walking in faith and in trust. And the next verse, chapter uh, 5, uh, verse 5, starts with that little word, but. So I feel this way, but I have trusted in thy loving kindness and thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice with me in thy salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he's dealt bountifully with me. And so one of the things that we gain from the spring of the Lord is joy. But this psalmist, did you see how he chose it? This is how I feel, but I'm going to walk here. I'm going to remember it. And so I choose joy. That's kind of a buzzword right now. I choose joy. But it really is a decision to remember what he saved us from, to remember the joy of our salvation and walk in it. So we lift our eyes higher. And we see what the Lord has done for us through salvation. And so we choose to draw from the springs of salvation, which is Jesus himself. Another thing that we get from his spring is eternal life. You're probably going to hear John quoted a lot today because Jesus spoke of that. He said to that Samaritan woman at the well, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him. And he would give you living water. He's talking about a water that's different than this. The water that refreshes the soul and causes life. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. I, I'm thirsty right now. We... You know, we get thirsty all day long. But that living water that he gives us is eternal. So he's talking about something different than just the physical, isn't he? He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. So, so I came here asking. I'm asking. Fill me, Lord, 
with living water that continuously flows out of my belly because your spirit lives in me, fills me, and gives me my being. So that is our prayer, Lord. We're thirsty and we're asking. We need your living water. I love, you know, us, uh, the, the women that are speaking here, we didn't get together and say, okay, I'm going to say this. And what, you know, we did not confer. Um, and I love when I see the Holy Spirit bring the same confirmation. How precious is thy loving kindness, O God, and the children of men take refuge in the shadow of thy wings. They drink their fill of the abundance of thy house, and thou dost give them to drink of the rivers of delight, for with thee is the fountain of life, and in thy light we see light. Psalm 73, 28 says, But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of thy works. As I read through these verses, what I saw every time was this is what we get when we come to him for strength, for life, for joy, for refuge. But did you notice the verbs that we do? I have made the Lord God my refuge. That implies that I have to run to him. If I'm going to drink of his water, I got to take the cup and put it up here. You know? So these are promises. These are gifts from God. But our job, our response, is to take what he offers to us. If our hands are full of our own burdens, how do you juggle it all? You know, we've got to let go of those things. A decision has to be made to drink or not, to draw near or not. As I looked through these scriptures that I read, I see poor people and desperate people responding to this gracious invitation, come and drink. I have refreshment for you. Isaiah 55, I like this one. It, it starts with, ho, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts. It's like he's saying, hey, hey, there's an exclamation mark even. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come and buy and eat. How does that work? You don't need cash. You don't need shillings. Just come. Come. It's all free. It's from him. So then I started asking myself, as I read these verses, am I thirsty? Because, you know, I have to tell you, I've gone through drought times and, there are, and lazy times where I don't run to him and I don't drink. And I get parched. And you can get, if you're in those prolonged trials, you can... You can love Jesus, you can come to church, and you can sing the songs, but we get distracted by how we feel. We get distracted by those hard things. This is a song. Remember the song? As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul panteth after thee. Do you guys know that song? As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for thee, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. And I had to ask myself, does it? Is it right now? Have I been thirsting for him? Psalm 63, 1 and 2. O oh God, thou art my God, I shall earnestly seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee, my flesh yearns for thee in a dry and weary land where there's no water. Thus I have beheld thee in the sanctuary to see thy power and thy glory. And again, when I read scripture, I guess the way that I apply it is I ask myself the question, am I doing this? And if I'm not doing this, why not? 
Why am I not thirsty? Why am I not earnestly seeking him? A hundred reasons, all bad ones. Because he is the source of joy. Because he is the source of strength. Because he is the source of life. Because he is the one that refreshes the poor in spirit and the needy and the thirsty. Am I thirsty? Am I weary? Anybody weary? You guys? Am I the only one? Yeah. Psalm 143, for thy sake, for the sake of thy name, O Lord, revive me. In thy righteousness brings, in thy righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. I love how he does that. He never says no, ever, when we come to him and say, I'm thirsty for you. I need you. I'm hungry for you. I need you. Lord, build up that, build up the hunger. I stop being hungry, Lord. I'm coming to you. Build up my strength. Build up my joy. Pour it in me again. One of my favorite teachers, Gail Irwin, years ago uh, at a conference, he was talking about Psalm 84 passing through the valley of Baca, and that, uh, the valley of trouble. And he, and he talked about these people passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. And what he talked about was, you know, they're on their way from here to there, and they have to go, and maybe here is wonderful, and maybe here is wonderful, but in between, there's trouble. And that's life. You know, life does this. But he said, these that are passing through this valley of trouble are digging wells. They're, they're digging. They're looking for water. And the beauty of it was they're, they're digging so they themselves can be refreshed. And so in our trouble, a lot of times, when we run to him as we should, um, and he gives us that refreshment and that nourishment and that strength. We're digging a well, but the beauty is, he said, was that the people that come behind them get to take advantage of that well. And that's 2 Corinthians 1 in action, isn't it? That the comfort that we have received, we then pass on to other people and comfort them. Coming to him is also for broken people, contrite people. Isaiah 57, 15, for thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell in the lowly of spirit, in high and holy place, and also with the contrite in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. In my life, I've gone through times where I felt embarrassed for having to come to the Lord again and say, oh, Father, I've done it again. I've done it again. And he doesn't sit there waiting to say, well, it's about time you came back. That is not the heart of the Father. He is waiting there to bring comfort, to bring relief, to bring forgiveness. And so don't ever be ashamed if you are feeling contrition, if you are feeling overwhelmed with your humanness and, and sin and shame. He dwells with the contrite in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. And then in, in verse 18 also in, in Isaiah 57, it says, I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and to his mourners, creating the praise of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is far and to him who is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. He says that twice. In that verse, I will heal him. <coughs> I looked up in the dictionary 
the word contrite. It says the feeling or showing sorrow or remorse or and remorse for a sin or a shortcoming. God is looking for us when we are feeling that sorrow so he can take it. He can, that's what the cross is all about. That's what we bring to him. We bring him our sorrow. We bring him our shame. We bring him our sin. And then he pours into us his life and his forgiveness. So these springs are to give us joy. These springs are to give us strength and to help us remember our salvation. These springs are to quench our thirst and, and, to, and to make us feel full when we're hungry. And they're to um, help us when we're weary and when we're broken and when we're ashamed. Am I hungry? These are questions that I asked myself as I read these verses. Am I thirsty? Am I hungry? I'm reading this book called Made to Crave by Lisa Turkhurst. I guess that's how you say her name. She's speaking of cravings. It's actually, well, anyway, um, she's speaking of of cravings. And she says, are they a curse or a blessing, cravings? You know, I usually, when I think of the word cravings, I think of pregnant women. You know, we crave this. I want a pickle. I want cabbage. I want hot and spicy, whatever. We crave it. And we might say to her, I never did this but to my husband, but I know people that have said, I need some, this right now. And they get out of bed in the middle of the night and run to the store and buy whatever that is because they're having a craving. But she was talking about cravings and she said, are they a curse or a blessing? And she said, the answer to that depends on what we're craving. And what we are craving will always depend on whatever we're consuming. The object of our desire or God and his truth. So I asked myself, Lord, am I craving you? Am I like that deer that just wants more and more and more of you? There's a pretty sobering verse in Jeremiah and it covers God's perspective on what it is that we're drinking. Are we coming to him, that fountain of life? Or are we going other places to satisfy those longings, to satisfy our loneliness, our pain, whatever? Jeremiah 2.13 says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. You hear about cisterns a lot more here in Kenya than you do in America, or at least wherever I have lived, holding tanks to to catch water and store it for use. It's what you want when you turn the faucet on or when you put the bucket in, cisterns. So the question is, when you are weary, broken, ashamed, all of that, where have you gone? for your refreshment. Have you hewn cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water? It's, it's important what he says here because he calls that evil. He says, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me. I don't like to think of myself that way, but it, that's what his word says. When I go someplace else for, for numbing my pain, for all of those things we've mentioned, when I go somewhere else, God's perspective 
is that we have forsaken him. He's our husband. We're his bride. He wants us to come to him for those things. And the second evil is that we found another way to try to get satisfaction, and that is these cisterns that we have hewn that can hold no water. I want you to be thinking about that. That's a question that we need to be honest about. Now, those cisterns, those sources that we go to for relief, for numbing, all of that stuff, they can look very innocent. It might be as silly as, oh, I want to play Candy Crush. Do you do that here? Candy Crush Saga? It's a computer game. It's, it's, it's harmless. You just match colors. And it goes, blah, 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 you know. But if you're doing that 20 hours a day because you're having a hard time thinking about life, you've hewn a cistern. If you're going to sex or alcohol or drugs or... For, I, my friend told me years ago that when she just feels like she's got to do something, she just goes shopping. They had money in, at her household, and, but she was hiding the credit card bills from her husband. because. And she said, I would bring the clothes home and put them in my closet and never wear them. The tags are still on them. She didn't want to return them, but she said, I do it because I'm, I'm bored. I'm, and, and she was addicted to it. That's a cistern. Ask the Lord to show you if you have hewn cisterns, if you have looked for ways to be satisfied or refreshed apart from him. Because his living water is eternal. It'll never go away. Those things will never be a source of life. If you're thinking of yours right now, and it's making you squirm, if you can feel it in your gut, you know what it is. You know what, your sis you know what you've been doing. You know where you've been looking for satisfaction that's not Jesus. You know those things. He doesn't want you to live in that. He doesn't want you to wallow. He just wants you to forsake it and bring it back to him. There's, a, there's an account in 2 Kings um, of a town that was situated in a really nice place. Uh, it's in 2 Kings 2. But the water nearby was not good. It was poisonous. It was bad. And the prophet came and spoke over that. So if your sister, and if you've been drinking water that's not good, here's the thing I love about the Lord. Or maybe you're just stale and stagnant. Now, I realize this isn't directly related to drinking from a fountain, but it says, thus says the Lord, I have purified these waters. There shall not be from their death or unfruitfulness any longer. That is the result when we switch from drinking cistern stale water to drinking living water, that, there, that life happens and there will be fruitfulness, no more unfruitfulness any longer. Do you remember the, the account of Jesus feeding the 4,000? Of course you do. Jesus asks a question of the apostles. And, and he wants to know, if, what do we have for food around here? He says, I feel compassion because for three days these have had nothing to eat. If I send them home, they might faint. And to paraphrase, that means, what do we have? Let's feed them. I've heard that story my entire life. I was raised in church, was raised with the Bible, and I saw the miracle of the feeding of the 4,000 and then the other one with the miracle of feeding of the 5,000. But this time, I, it just blew off the page where Jesus said, I feel compassion for the hungry. See, this shows us God's heart for hungry people. 
I don't want them to faint. Let's feed them. But in the process of feeding them, not only were the people eating and, and they were satisfied, but his apostles were learning something. You know the story? They had some bread. It was probably like chapati or something. I, you know, I don't think of like the big wonder bread sandwich bread. It was probably something that they could cook on a, a griddle or something. But they had a few. And as Jesus broke it and handed it out to the apostles, they would walk out and break it again. And they just kept breaking it. And it just kept multiplying. And then all those people were fed. And and I was just thinking about that broken bread in desolate places. They ate and were satisfied. Look what Jesus can do with broken pieces. And you might feel broken, but look what he can do with broken pieces. It is precious to him. When we come to him in brokenness and contrition, and we say, Lord, fill me, use me. And we think we can't ever be used because we're broken, because that pain hurt me, or those people hurt me, or whatever it is. I want to just encourage you what Jesus can do with broken people. Because when we're desperate, we listen up real hard. We're very attentive to his voice. And even after amazing things have happened, maybe even walking with the Lord, and like Elijah on, the, on Mount Carmel and... You know, it, it was a battle. It was a, you know, let's compare gods. You got the 450 prophets of Baal, and then you've got Elijah. Um, and you know the contest and all that. And in that contest, God revealed himself as the God. And the result then was that the 450 prophets of Baal were killed. And it's remarkable. It's like, yeah, we've... We've eliminated these idols and these, this wor idol worship. Um, that's a pretty heady thing for, for a prophet, I would think. But then, you know, came Jezebel's death threat. And this amazing thing that happened on this mountain is now followed by fear and exhaustion and depression. And he ran and he prayed to die. And then it says that wherever he ran to, he laid down and he slept. What is God's heart towards hungry, desperate people? He feels compassion, but he doesn't just sit around feeling sorry for them. He does something about it. He sent an angel. He sent an angel to Elijah. He touched him. He woke him up, strengthened him, fed him, did it again. And then as he was about to send him out, he said, this journey is too great for you. And Elijah went on the strength of that food and water for 40 days. No matter how hungry and thirsty you are, how weak, how broken, tired, weary, whatever God calls us to do is always going to be too great for us. Always. And we must come to him for refreshment. God also spoke to Elijah about specific issues. You're not alone in this. We're going to raise up Elisha. Go get him. And then his words as he ministered brought peace, and it brought answers, and it brought hope to Elijah. So Jesus is inviting us to come to him, to drink the living water that's found in him. My exhortation to you today would to, be, would to be honest. Be honest about where you are in this coming to him process. Because it's a good thing. It's a good trade trading our heartaches for his life, trading our weakness for his strength. It's a good trade, trading our sin for his forgiveness. He invites us to come. 
and to drink the living water that's found only in him. Only in him. My life, my married life, to my husband of 49 years, has been filled with lean times and times that were not lean. We have seen the Lord provide for us in a wilderness over and over and over and over and over again. He will never fail you. And as we drink of the living water and take in the provision that he has for us, we're passing that on to our children. And they're learning to see that this God is real and that he will provide. So I encourage you, I want you to be thinking about those cisterns that you've been drinking from. And I want you today to trade those in, to get rid of that, and to come back to drinking from his springs of living water. Father, it is so true, all of our springs are in you. Everything we need for life and godliness, they're in you. Forgive us, Lord, where we have looked other places. I think of Isaiah, Father, saying, Woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and live among unclean people. And then the angel comes and brings the coal, puts it on his mouth and cleanses him and makes him fit for service. That's us, Lord. Hungry and thirsty. Unstable. Oh, Lord, work in our hearts. May your joy begin to bubble up in us as we bring, as we empty our hands of our cares and concerns. Fill us, O oh Lord, pour out on these women, Lord, fresh living water. Feed us with manna and we'll take it, Lord. We need it, we'll take it. There is no other life but in you. And thank you, Jesus, for what you did. Thank you for standing up in that temple and saying, are you thirsty? Come to me. And thank you for doing that here today. Are you thirsty? Come to me. Yes, we're thirsty, Lord. Yes, we want you. And we're going to drink of you. In Jesus' name, amen.